thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is a special episode of Gnostic Lectures. This is uh, episode number two of three. My host today, Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. How are you, Jim? Fine, thank you, Rick. Thank you very much again for allowing me to be here. A thanks to our listeners. So this is episode number two of three, and the title is Sex, A Stairway to Heaven or a Stairway to Hell, but this is the religious aspect, right? That's correct. Yeah, today this is a religious approach, part two of a series of three. This is extremely important because we already spoke about, you know, a, a scientific approach into sexuality we should call it sexology because the sexology being taught in universities or at schools are extremely very incomplete it's like they ignore really even the closest scientific approach the smallest scientific approach that we already described before when we spoke about the Oneida community we spoke about the Caretha method and even the Diana method uh, discoveries that happened on Earth, you know, just a few years ago. But for a mysterious reason, they've been ignored. And our universities of biology, teaching biology and teaching medicine and teaching sexology, they, they decided to ignore all of these discoveries. Today, we are going to reinforce the same concepts, but now from a religious approach. Because, you know, all religions, without exception, have been talking about sexology. In many cases, you know, using a very symbolic language. And our mission today is to be able to unveil that sim symbolic, you know, approach. So we are going to be touching, you know, the Bible, one of the most read books in human history, according to many people. So, um, some people, you know, would say, well, you know, from a religious point of view, you know, apparently sex is something taboo. We shouldn't be talking about sexuality, but the Bible speaks about it in almost every page. The Bible is written in a codified language. We said that before, uh, in a alchemist language based on alchemy a very ancient science and based in Kabbalah another very ancient science given to humanity by a superior being uh, an angel Metraton you know so we are going to be talking you know about do you remember Jesus Christ teachings when he spoke with Nicodemus and in that occasion Nicodemus was a Jewish religious leader. He was a Pharisee. So he came to speak to Jesus. And he said, Teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. But Jesus, you know, Jesus answered and said, I assure you, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus was so surprised, you know. He said, what do you mean? How can an old man like me go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, the truth is, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Yes, you can hear the wind, but cannot tell where it comes from or where is it, it is going, so you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. Nicodemus was more surprised than before, and he said, What do you mean, you know? Jesus replied, You are a respected Jewish teacher, 
and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, I am telling you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe us. But you don't even believe me when I tell you about things that happen here on earth. How can you possibly believe if I tell you what is going on in heaven? For only I, the Son of Man, have come to earth and will return to heaven again. And as, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, wilderness, so I, the Son of Man, must be lifted up on a pole, so that everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. There is no judgment awaiting those who trust him, but those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing in the only Son of God. Their judgment is based on this fact. The light from heaven came into the world, but they loved darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. They hate the light because they want to sin in the darkness. They stay away from the light for fear their sins will be exposed and they will be punished. But those who do what is right come to the light gladly so everyone can see that they are doing what God wants. You know, this is it's been in the Bible for a long, long time, you know. And some people speak about it, but in reality, do they, do they understand what he meant? What's the real meaning of it? At the beginning of his sentence, Jesus Christ described, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is water and what's the Spirit? We said before, you know, in our previous lecture, that we are all made of semen, semen. Semen. The semen of our physical father, physical mother. Some women don't like to be spoken about semen, you know, but it is also semen, which is water. So our matter is composed of the water of semen, the water of life. So this is the reason why we descended from our ancestors, our father, our parents, our grandparents, and behind and behind and before and before, we got, you know, the influence from the past through the semen of our ancestors. And this is the water. And what about the spirit? How do we describe the spirit? You know, the spirit has been described in the Bible as the fire, the divine fire of God. Or we can also say the masculine aspect of God. And the water is the feminine aspect. But in reality, you know, nobody speaks about the semen. People speak about the ocean, the rivers, the lakes, the rain, the clouds. You know, they are all water. But in reality, we don't realize that the semen of planet Earth, which is a gigantic living organism, is the water of the oceans, is the water of the rivers and the lakes, of the clouds and of the rain the feminine aspect of God. You know, matter, this is matter. When we try to understand the meaning of the word matter is coming from, you know, um, from Latin, re, Latin language, and it means mother. So mother nature, mother earth can be synthesized in water. And the spirit is fire. We can also say the solar energy the electricity, and also our sexual energy, the fire that we all carry within, our veins, our molecules, our atomic particles, our electrons, and our cells. When we die physically, isn't it that our body becomes cold, the sign of death? 
because the fire, the fire, the spirit is gone. So this is important to be understood. So Jesus Christ was teaching Nicodemus that we are all coming descend from sex. We all know that without Jesus Christ telling us, but we don't pay attention enough that if we want to ascend into heaven, we have to be born again. Because most of people are convincing, and many religious institutions, you know, through their priests and reverends and rabbis, are telling their followers that we all go to heaven after we die, which is not true because there is an incomplete understanding of the real meaning, you see, of what we do in our lives. If we really want to ascend into heaven, to become, we could say, a habitant of heaven, we have to ascend into a higher level of being. You know, religious call them angels, archangels, thrones, seraphims, cherubims, etc., etc. Ancient religions call them the gods, the ancient gods the Elohim, the Cosmo Creators, superior beings, our brothers in a higher level of being, who have incarnated aspects of God higher than, the, than what we have incarnated. So this is important to be understood. So the purpose of sex is not only to procreate, it is also the stairway to heaven to ascend and becoming into a higher level of being, we, we should say complete human beings, because right now we are not. We call ourselves humans, but according to Gnostic anthropology, we are just intellectual animals. It means we carry within ourselves a human psychology, but also a very strong animal psychology. We could say our ego is 97% of animal psychology and our soul, our human soul is only 3%. So we are more animals than humans. And according to our lectures in the past, we said that complete human beings have 12 senses and we only have intellectual animals. We only have five senses. And those five senses sometimes are more degenerated than of an animal, you know. Animals can see better than we do. Animals can smell better. Animals can hear sounds better than we do. And animals are really inferior to our species. Why is that? Because we have entered into a stage of degeneration. We said that before. We became more animals than humans. So if we really want to walk away from the animal kingdom, and to ascend into the real human being's kingdom, we have to be able to annihilate the animal psychology, the ego. We said that before. But now, part of it, part of it is to be able to be born again. And that's going to be explained, you know, better, slowly, slowly, so we can really communicate properly. Continuing with the Bible, if we go into the book of Leviticus, 15 to 18, 15 to 18, book of Leviticus. Please pay attention to what we are saying, what we are trying to say to everyone, including ourselves, so we won't forget. Leviticus 15 to 18, it says, 15, number 15, bodily discharges. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, his assistant, give these further instructions to the Israelites. Any man who has a genital discharge is ceremonially unclean because of it. This defilement applies where the discharge continuous or is stopped up. In either case, the man is unclean. Any bedding on which he lies and anything on which he sits will be defiled. So if you touch the man's bedding, 
you will be required to wash your clothes and bathe in water, and you will remain ceremonially defiled until evening. If you sit where the man with the discharge has sat, you will be required to wash your clothes and bathe in water. You will then remain defiled until evening. The same instructions apply if you touch the man who has the unclean discharge, and if he spits on you, you must undergo the same procedure. Any blanket on which the man writes will be defiled. If you touch or carry anything that was under him, you will be required to wash your clothes and bathe in water, and you will remain defiled until evening. If the man touches you without first rinsing his hands, then you will be required to wash your clothes and bath in water, and you will remain defiled until evening. Any clay pot touched by the man with a discharge must be broken, and every wooden utensil he touches must be rinsed with water. Can we really understand that, you know? Moses was given this message from God. So God spoke to Moses and Aaron, his second man in, in command, leading, you know, people from Israel at that time, thousands of years ago. So Moses knew about this. You know, when the Oneida community said that it is not good to lose our semen because we create all kinds of illnesses. Here in New York, in a city next to Canada, in Niagara Falls, when the Caretza method is developed in Europe, when the Diana method, just recently, they are just, you know, saying or discovering what was discovered a long time ago. A message given by God to Moses. Now, if we continue, you know, with Leviticus 15, now God said to Moses and Aaron, when the man the church heals, he must count of a period of seven days. During that time, he must wash his clothes and bathe in fresh spring water. Then he will be ceremonially clean. On the high day, on the eighth day, he must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons and present himself to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle and give his offerings to the priest. You see, after, if we continue reading the Bible, you know, we can find this sentence. Whenever a man has an emission of semen, he must wash his entire body, and he will remain ceremonially defiled until evening. After having sexual intercourse, intercourse both the man and the woman must bathe, and they will remain defiled until evening. It says also, whenever a woman has her menstrual period, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. If you touch her during that time, you will be defiled until evening. You know, it's the same approach into what, you know, was mentioned before. To continue, it says, if a man has sexual intercourse with her, with a woman, during this time, her menstrual impurity will be transmitted to him. He will remain defiled for seven days, and any bed on which he lies will be defiled. You see, then it continues. When the woman's me menstrual discharge stops, she must count off a period of seven days. After that, she will be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, she must bring, you know, and it's a similar ceremony, a religious, you know, ritual, bringing those pigeons and, and present them to the priest at the entrance of, of the temple. Now, here it says in Leviticus number 18, forbidden sexual practices. Then the Lord said to Moses, say this to your people, the Israelites, I, the Lord, am your God. So do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live or like the people of Canaan, what I'm talking, what I'm taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all my regulations 
and be careful to keep my laws, for I, the Lord, am your God. If you obey my laws and regulations, you will find life through them. I am the Lord. You must never have sexual intercourse with a close relative. Do not violate your father by having sexual intercourse with your mother. She is your mother. You must never have intercourse with her. Do not have sexual intercourse with any of your father's wives, for the, this good violate your father. Do not have sexual intercourse with your sister or half-sister, whether she is your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she has brought up in the same family or somewhere else. Do not have sexual intercourse with your granddaughter, whether your son's daughter or your daughter's, daughter's daughter. That would violate you. Do not have sexual intercourse with the daughter or any of your father's wives. She is your half-sister. Do not have intercourse with your aunt, your father's sister, because she is your father's close relative. And do not violate your uncle, your father's brother, by having sexual intercourse with his wife. She also is your aunt. Do not have sexual intercourse with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Do not have intercourse with your brother's wife. This would violate your brother. Do not have sexual intercourse with both a woman and her daughter, or marry both a woman and her granddaughter, whether her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are close relatives, and to do this would be a horrible wickedness. Do not marry a woman and her sister, because they will be rivals. But if your wife dies, then it is all right to marry her sister. Do not violate a woman by having sexual intercourse with her during her period or men menstrual impurity. Do not defy yourself by having sexual intercourse with your neighbor's wife. Do not give any of your children as a sacrifice to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not practice homosexuality. It is a detestable sin. A man must never defile himself by having sexual intercourse with an animal, and a woman must never present herself to a male animal in order to have intercourse with it. This is a terrible perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of those ways, because this is how the people I'm expelling from the Promised Land have defiled themselves. As a result, the entire land has become defiled. That is why I'm punishing the people who live there, and the land will soon vomit them out. You must strictly obey all my laws and regulations, and you must not do any of these detestable things. This applies both to you who are Israelites by birth and to the foreigners living among you. All these detestable activities are practiced by the people of the land where I'm taking you, and the land has become defiled. Do not give the land a reason to vomit you out for defiling it, as it will vomit out the people who live there now. Whoever does any of these detestable things will be cut off from the community of Israel. So be careful to obey my laws, and do not practice any of these detestable activities. Do not defile yourselves by doing any of them, for I, the Lord, am your God. You see, why is all of this, you know, is talking about punishment, to talking about wrongdoing, talking about something which is against the divinity, against the spirit, against God. Why? The reason is that, as we said it, sex is a stairway to heaven or is a stairway to hell. If we don't obey to the law dictated by Moses, you know, the Ten Commandments, if we remember the Ten Commandments, let's only go to number six and number nine. Number six is we should not fornicate. No fornication. What is fornication? That's exactly what we are talking about right now. Losing our semen. Having sex without losing our semen is having sex the right way, the proper way. What the Oneida community in our past lecture has discovered, what they, they did for 30 years practicing living in a community in New York, 
the US, United States. What the Caressa method continue doing, what the Diana method continue doing. Understanding, you know, what Moses was saying thousands of years ago, what told, what God had told Moses. So again, sex a stairway to heaven or a stairway to hell. So people, in this case, most of our humanity, who doesn't know this knowledge, who doesn't practice this kind of superior sex without committing fornication, the sixth commandment, they don't even know what they are doing because there is another paragraph in the same Bible that says, all your sins will be forgiven except one, the one against the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what it is. What, what is that? The Holy Spirit is the aspect of the divinity who heals us. It's life itself. The Holy Spirit incarnated within matter, within the divine mother of the universe, you know, within the water, we are made of semen, made of water. And the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us life. When we die physically, the fire or the Holy Spirit is gone. Now, why do we die so young? Because we, this, we get sick, we get ill at a very young age. People live today only 70, 80, 90. If somebody gets to 100, it's a miracle. You know, most of people don't believe it is possible to live so much. But we forgot that in ancient times. And statistics say the opposite. They, they don't agree with it. But we know in ancient times, people lived a thousand years. During the time of the Adams and the Eves, before they collapsed, before they fell, some a stage of grace, people lived 1,200 years normally. 1,200 years, more than a thousand years. Because they knew no illness. And the cause of illness, all illness, all sickness, from the common cold to cancer and AIDS, is coming from losing our semen. Is coming from fornication that Moses was told and Moses was teaching at his followers at, at the very ancient time. And Jesus Christ, you know, he didn't come to deny that when Jesus Christ was asked, Master, Jesus, are you coming to deny the law and the prophets? The answer for, from Jesus was, I am not. I'm coming to fulfill them. I'm coming to follow them and fulfill them. It means the Ten Commandments given to humanity by Moses. What about the commandment number nine? Is committing adultery. So number six, no fornication. We should loosen our semen. The cause of all illness and the cause of dying so young. Because when we are only 80 years of age, we're babies in an aged body, an aged mind living so such a short period of time because we don't know how to have sex. We don't know how to make love. Can you imagine something so basic in human life? So when Jesus Christ was teaching Nicodemus that he had to be born again, it means exactly that. To be born again, you have to practice with your wife. Or if you are a woman, you practice with your husband. This kind of sexuality given to humanity by all the prophecies written in all sacred books, in many cases in a codified language called alchemy, sexual alchemy. Sexual alchemy means to transform lead into gold or to spiritualize matter because our semen is matter, is matter. So, and the spirit is fire. So if we can transform our semen into fire, what happens? You see, this is why when we don't lose our semen, the water, the water of life will be transformed into a steam, clouds. This is exactly what Mother Nature is doing all the time. The clouds are coming from the heat of the waters of the ocean, the lakes and the rivers, and that water ascends, transformed into a more purified level of existence. And then after that, we see it is raining because that water is already purified, more purified than the water we have on Earth with a lot of contamination, our own contamination. But also, 
when there is a storm, the lightning bolts means the spirit of nature, the Holy Spirit, the fire of nature, the electricity, the lightning bolts lives within that water and in this case that water had been transformed into a higher level of being. That's exactly what a man and a woman can do together. That's exactly the meaning of it. How can we live longer? How, how can we eliminate illness? Because all our sin will be forgiven except this. So being sick is punishment. It is the law of cause and effect. In reality, God doesn't punish us. We punish ourselves out of ignorance. So a common cold is illness. But when we get cancer, we really care about it because cancer is a very dangerous illness. And I'm telling you, cancer is spreading all over the earth right now. Even kids, children are being born with cancer. And in reality, because, listen to this carefully, we are children of fornication. Because our parents procreated us losing their semen. Seven million spermatozoos lost in one ejaculation. And only one procreated. And today, you know, there are men who cannot procreate anymore because their semen is not good anymore. The sperm's count is telling humanity that most of men in the near future won't be able to procreate life because the sperm count is telling us that there is something wrong with the way we have sex. Imitating animals. We said before, you know, animals are okay because, you know, innocent. For them to procreate, you know, this is what they need to do. But animals use sex to procreate. We, intellectual animals, do it to experience animal pleasure. And as we said it before, we bring children into the world not wanted. They are an accident. And it's very sad because when children are not wanted, who loves them? You know, only God, the universe loves them. But their parents prefer to ignore them because they, they were an accident. So when a woman decides to have the baby and not to, to kill the baby, maybe the mother will be, the single mother will be the only one who will care about the child and maybe the relatives. But most of parents, most of fathers walk away. When the child came through a sexual encounter without thinking in procreation, and in most of cases, we are telling you 99.99% .99 children are not wanted. Isn't it tragic? And of course, when children are not wanted, they grow up without love, without affection, and of course they will transmit. It's a vicious circle. They will transmit the same kind of psychology to their own descendants. And this is why there is an absence of love within humanity. There is a lot of possibilities now to hate life. When you are a child not loved, not wanted, you grow up abandoned. Maybe you jump into crime, prostitution, you know, all kind of criminal activities and even war, you know, war because you hate the world. You hate yourself. You hate your parents. You hate humanity. So it's easier to jump into a battlefield and kill the enemy because you also hate them. Don't we realize that? Something so simple, a conclusion, you know. So Mozart was a wise man, a, a man with powers. Why did he have so many powers? He had 12 senses minimum. When he didn't lose his semen, he created a superior nature within himself. He transformed his waters into a superior kind of water. He separated what the Bible said, the Genesis, to separate the water from the waters. You see, the common semen will become a steam. This is separating the water from the waters. And that steam will ascend through the spine. And this is exactly what Moses did. You know, the stuff of Moses represents the spine. And the 33 levels, when they say Jesus Christ lived 33 years, it's not true. It was a symbolic approach into his life. In reality, Jesus Christ did exactly what Moses did. 33 levels. Today, the Masons speak about that, you know. They speak about 
Master, 33 degree master of the Masons. Is it true? Is it really true? Or they, they only say it, you know? I remember the Masons from the past. You know, they were the freedom fighters, you know? They were fighting the monarchy, the corruption of the monarchies in Europe. And they brought that influence into America. The freedom fighters in the US and Canada, they were Masons who studied in Europe, in universities in Europe, normally wealthy families who could send them to Europe to study and they brought back this knowledge from the Masons, you know, which is freedom because when you learn to ascend into a higher level of being, you try to annihilate your animal psychology. You try to walk away from the animal sexual activity because what, when we lose seven spermatozoos in one orgasm, in one ejaculation, we are imitating animals without being animals 100%. So we're wrong. We're doing something very much against us. All our sin will be forgotten except that. Will be forgiven except that. When we lose our sexual energies, we commit suicide. We kill ourselves. And we bring children into the world which are also as sick as we are. So we all carry the virus of cancer. You know, cancer is a molecular virus. So we are all children of fornication, or most of us. It means that we carry the illness within ourselves. This is why we live such a short period of time, 18, 90, maximum 100 years of age. Because we have no respect for the laws of nature. We forgot what Moses brought into humanity. We forgot what Jesus Christ reinforced. We forgot we ignore even the scientific communities, <laughs> the universities, the students of biology and medicine, psychiatrists, who they call themselves sexologists. They ignore this. They provide young people with condoms and they say, this is it. Sexual education, they call it. Come on, come on, you know, scientific community. Come on, teachers. Isn't it time to check us up and to stop sleeping and snoring 24 hours a day regarding sexuality? Sex is stairway to heaven or a stairway to hell? So Leviticus 19, you know, Leviticus 19, the Lord also said to Moses, say this to the entire community of Israel, you must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, I'm holy. Each of, each of you must show respect for your mother and father, and you must always observe my Sabbath days of rest, for I, the Lord, am your God. Do not put your trust in idols or make gods of metal for yourselves. I, the Lord, am your God. You see, this is also connected with Leviticus 15 to 18. You see, Basically, he's telling, he's telling humanity at that time, you know, something extremely important that was not only religious, a religious approach into reality, into sexuality. It was also a scientific approach. So when Moses practiced this superior kind of knowledge, Moses developed his superior senses. So when he learned to practice, you know, sexual alchemy, and sexual Kabbalah. Sexual alchemy means learning to transform matter into a spirit or a spiritualizing matter. When the water, the water of life, our own semen, is transforming into clouds, into a steam, and it is ascending slowly, slowly through the spine until it reaches the brain and from there will reach the heart. Then you, we can see this is exactly the symbol of medicine. This is why the ancient Greeks who created the symbol of medicine, the Caduceus or Mercury, that's exactly what they wanted to tell the world, you know. This is the mystery of illness and the mystery of health. So by doing that, by saving your sexual energy and making the waters of life to ascend, together, connected with the fire. So fire and water move together into the brain 
and move together into the heart. And in their ascension, they are touching. You know, from a scientific point of view, they are touching the seven endocrine glands. This is why, for a mysterious reason today, doctors don't want to talk too much about endocrinology. Why is that? Because, is it because, you know, the programs for universities regarding medicine and biology don't want people to know, they don't even want doctors to know that this is a secret way to awaken superior senses. Every endocrine gland, seven endocrine glands, represent a superior sense. So seven superior senses plus five make 12. And this is why Mozart had 12 senses. Mozart had the power to invoke the wind, to invoke, you know, the ocean, the waters, to invoke Mother Nature. Mother Nature obeyed. Because Mother Nature, even she is our mother, our divine mother, she wants her children, all of us, to ascend into a level, into a level of perfect children. Perfection is possible to be reached. And this is exactly what Moses did, you know. The Bible don't speak about Moses, you know, becoming a resurrected master. But we know within Gnostic anthropology, we know that he did what Jesus Christ also did. He also resurrected physically with the same physical body that died. But it was a a different kind of physical body. It was a body, you know, that was perfected through the power of the fire, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of his own electricity, of his own body, the power of his own solar energy within his glands, through the power of his own sexual energy, mixed with an ascended matter, or a water transformed into a steam. So all endocrine glands became not only regenerated because they are already degenerated. When we've been fornicating for thousands and of years, our ancestors have transmitted us their own degeneration. So we were born degenerated. This is why we were born with only five senses, more degenerated than the ones of an animal when we were supposed to have already 12 senses, a complete human being. And Moses did it. He was capable of ascending into the right level of perfection. And, you know, not only him, many of his disciples did that. This is exactly what Jesus Christ came to teach after. And not only them, all founders of all religions came to teach the same principles because All sacred books are written in the same codified language, alchemy or sexual alchemy and Kabbalah. So again, alchemy is matter, learning to transform matter into a higher level of perfection, transforming lead into gold or spiritualizing matter. When we do that, listen to this carefully, when we transform water into steam, and the steam becomes clouds. We see the fire doesn't abandon. The fire doesn't abandon water. It stays inside. And this is why we see through Mother Nature in a storm, powerful lightning bolts, thunderous, explosion descending from the power of air and water and fire and earth combined. Mother Nature is telling us something, teaching us something. But of course, we don't see it. We don't realize it. We can do exactly the same kind of things. When Moses commanded the ocean to open up, he commanded the air and he commanded the species. They obeyed him because the divine mother of the universe, the feminine aspect of God, gave him the keys for heaven. So living among us, he had the power to use the powers of heaven you know, at that time, to command nature to teach us a lesson what has to be done to be able to ascend. So sexuality is not only to procreate. Please remember my words. Sexuality is not only a way to procreate. But it is wrong to use sexuality for only animal pleasure. 
let animals do that. But animals are more intelligent than we do because we don't lose too much semen as we do. They procreate children, babies, and they are strong children. But we procreate children that are coming into life very sick, very ill, very degenerated. So this is extremely important. All sacred books of all religions speak about that. The, the, same, the same seven endocrine glands are described from a different point of view when they speak about the chakras in yoga, Hindu, you know, Hinduism and also Tibetan, Tibetan religion and the Hindu religion both speak about yoga, Tibetan yoga and Hindu yoga. If we want to understand Buddhism, what's the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism? Buddhism is a religion that came after Hinduism. Hinduism is a very ancient religion that existed, you know, in very ancient times. But before the Hindu religion, there was another religion from ancient China, the Tao, the Tao, Taoism, the ancient Tao religion. Taoism maybe continues having existence through maybe martial arts, some kind of martial arts. And, but then the first Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who created Buddhism, he decided to put together the ancient Tao religion from ancient China with the ancient also Hinduism. And then Buddhism came into the world. So there is a strong connection between both religions. But the interesting part is that there is no contradiction between Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, and Christianity, Catholicism, and Judaism, and even the Muslim religion. There is no contradiction. All religions teach the same principles, exactly the same principles, because all founders of all religions, they reached this higher level of being, practicing this kind of superior sexuality. Sex is their way to heaven, and they did it the proper way, and they walk away from sex as a stairway to hell. What most of people today are doing, and this is why we suffer. We don't even know why we suffer. We don't even know why the genius, we all carry a genius within. Why is it that the genius is sleeping 24 hours a day and never wakes up? Because we don't have the energy to awaken it. So isn't it time already to realize that we have to correct the way we have sex. Understanding that sex without love is completely wrong. Sex should be something divine, taught by God to Moses directly, you see. And Moses was teaching to his disciples and his own experiences, because in reality, Moses wasn't repeating as a parrot. He was telling humanity at that time what he had learned already through experience. Now, Jesus Christ came to reinforce what Moses did completely. The trouble is, you know, the Catholic Church has created something that the, the actual Pope is, you know, describing in a very interesting way of doing it. Celibacy. Jesus Christ never spoke about celibacy. He never developed celibacy because all his disciples were married. Maybe Paul was the only one who didn't want to get married because he didn't want to marry a woman that he wasn't in love with. But eventually he found that woman. He, he married. And even Jesus Christ, and today there are some movies talking about that, you know, Hollywood movies. Uh, and those movies say that, and there are many rumors and many uh, perceptions that Jesus Christ was married to Mary Magdalene. Well, we do agree with that. Jesus Christ also had a wife, and he practiced also with his wife the superior kind of sexuality, to ascend. This is why when we say that he lived 33 years, in reality, even he was a superior being reincarnated on earth. He was a very high superior being. He reincarnated on earth out of love for us, to help us, because at that time, you know, the Roman Empire was doing a lot of harm to humanity. Instead of using the knowledge they learned from the ancient Greeks, 
they destroy that. And the ancient Greeks learned from the ancient Egyptians. And the ancient Egyptians also had collapsed. And the ancient Egyptians had learned from the ancient India. And the ancient India from the ancient Tibet. They all collapsed. And this is why, you know, when the Roman Empire was committing all kinds of atrocities and also contaminated the religions of, the, of, that, of that time, the Jewish religion was not obeying to Mozart teachings. They were obeying to the Roman Empire. The Egyptians who kept their religion also didn't obey to Hermes Trismegistus, one of the wisest men of ancient Egypt, another ascended master who practiced this superior kind of sex to transform into an angel or an archangel or a higher being who could live in heaven without any limitation. So then Jesus Christ came to correct that. Jesus Christ was a rabbi. He was a Jewish rabbi. Why is it that he influenced the creation of a new religion? Why? Because the same rabbis at that time didn't accept him didn't recognize him as a savior. They thought that it, he had nothing to do with Moses. And when there was a moment that his followers, the disciples of Jesus Christ, who also listened to this, who also learned the superior way of having sex with their wives, they all ascended. And within Gnostic anthropology, we say that the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, they all reached resurrection also. They all incarnated the cosmic Christ. Because the cosmic Christ is not a person. It's a superior force. It's a divine force. The Christ is the Son of God. So God is the Father, Divine Father, Divine Mother. The Christ is the perfect Son or the perfect Daughter. And the Holy Spirit is the Divine Spirit that lives within each one of us. But then we have a matter which is already contaminated because of our wrong lifestyle, the wrong sexuality through centuries and centuries and centuries. When we immerse within the ancient, the ancient Hindu religion, we must remember there are some sacred books written in their ancient language, the Vedas, the Vedas or Vedas. Well, in the Vedas, they speak about the fire. The fire or the Holy Spirit, the, the God fire, they call it. But in reality, it's the Holy Spirit. So basically, the importance of the fire within life, within the universe. Everything is connected with the fire. Everything is connected with solar energy. Everything is connected with electricity. Everything is connected with sexual energy, even if we try to deny it. You know, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Do you remember it described there are two trees, two trees, the tree of the science of good and evil. And the second tree is the tree of life. Listen to this carefully. The first tree is the tree of the science of good and evil. And God at that time, or Jehovah, the ruler of paradise, a manifestation of God, he told, you know, the Adams and the Eves, you know, don't eat, don't eat, you see, of the tree, the first tree of good and evil. Eat of the tree of life. That's exactly what he was <laughs> telling to Moses later. Because the Adams and the Eves collapsed from a stage of grace. They were an angelical humanity, do we know that? They were a superior kind of human beings who lived 1,200 years or more, they had superior senses. They had 12 senses, completely awakened. They knew no illness. They lived in paradise, in a stage of joy, happiness, peace, freedom, love, complete happiness. They knew no evil. And when Jehovah alerted them, don't eat at the tree of the tree of good and evil, the first tree eat only from the tree of life. The tree of life represents the spirit, the Holy Spirit, or you see the fire, electricity, 
solar energy, sexual energy. Don't lose your sexual energy. Don't expel from your organism the fire of God. Don't expel life from your glands. Don't kill yourself. Don't commit suicide. But, you know, people were tempted. And in reality, they said they were tempted by the serpent. A serpent ascending is divine. A serpent descending is evil. But in reality, you know, the temptation actually... Who created the temptation, you know? God himself, herself. Because, you know, life is a school of learning. Why are we here? We are here, we descended from the Absolute, and at the end of the times, we are all going to return to the Absolute. We descended as a tiny little spark of light, because the Absolute, the great reality of all realities, is a spiritual universe. It's a universe of light, where there is only one superior cosmic law, only one law, that rules that universe, which is what? Love. Love, love, love. Love means wisdom. Love means consciousness. Love, love means justice, freedom, joy, peace. The best of the best. Perfection within perfection. So we descended into matter for a purpose. It's a school of life. So we descended as a tiny little spark of light that lives within our own heart. So what is the purpose of life? Isn't, isn't it to, us, to return to the Absolute at the end of times, transform into, not into the same spark, isn't it the purpose of life to return as good as students of life into a flame? It means to transform the entire body into a flame. You see the point? So when the fire of the Holy Spirit ascends, from our genitals, the sexual energy, ascend through the spine, isn't it adopting a similar form to the serpent of fire? Moving, because the fire moves. Even the sound of the fire. Have you ever listened to the sound of a fire? Isn't it similar to the sound of a snake, of a serpent? With the same, this is why this is a symbolic way of trying to explain things. This is why the serpent is never evil, as many people believe. You know, Jesus Christ said to his disciples, you have to learn to be as peaceful as a dove, but also you have to learn to be as astute as a snake. Why do we have to learn to be astute? Because in a corrupt world, in a corrupt society, in a corrupt humanity, where their leaders are corrupt and very astute, people who fornicate, people who lose their energies and become corrupted, destroying their intelligence and awakening evil. We have to learn to be how to survive by understanding their evil and to become more astute than they are. And this is exactly what the disciple of Jesus Christ had to do. When you become a preacher, when you are spreading the news of heaven and God, you have to fight against a lot of blocks. People who hate you, people who don't want to listen to you, people who spit on you, people who will kick and punch you. But if you learn to be peaceful as a dove and astute as a snake, you will understand their evil, so you are not going to be interrupted in your mission. And also, as Jesus Christ said, learning to love your worst enemies. Love is not hugging and kissing only. Love is much more than that. Love is comprehension. Love is understanding. Love is knowing knowledge, plus knowledge, plus knowledge. Or gnosis, learning to know everything. We, we know evil, then temptation won't make us fall. And this is the trouble, you know. In ancient lives, in ancient past, our ancestors and even ourselves fell from a stage of grace. We all descended from Adam and Eve. So our ancestors really collapsed because of temptation. 
But today, after so many years have passed, we must have learned how to transcend temptation. Understanding that animal sex is wrong, fornication is wrong. And also, you see, the ninth commandment, we didn't explain it yet, the ninth commandment of Moses, the Ten Commandments, says, don't commit adultery. Did we know that when you have sex with so many sexual partners, you get what we can call the good luck and the bad luck from the sexual partner. We, the, what we call karma. You know, because we fornicated in past lives and our ancestor transmitted that karma into our own selves, which is our life short, our illness, our lower intelligence, etc., etc., this is karma, you know, the law of cause and effect, degeneration. So basically, when we not only fornicate, but we also have different sexual partners, we get influenced. We carry those particles, atomic particles, that live within the body of our different sexual partners into our own organisms. And of course, they are bad luck, they are karma, they are suffering will be transmitted into our own lives. This is ma why a man who sleeps with prostitutes, who will have sex with many clients, many of them are evil, perverse individuals. All the bad luck of those evil and perverse individuals will be transmitted to this man, who is unfaithful to his wife. And after he will have sex with his wife and will transmit the bad luck to his own wife. Couples, separate sooner or later because of that. They, they marry very much being in love and a few years later they don't like each other anymore. And the cause was both fornication and adultery. Because when we lose our sexual energies, all the enchantment before having animal sex is gone. People fall asleep, they are tired, Normally the man ignore the woman because it's not with the energies enough to continue. The woman is, um, you know, very frustrated. And this is what people call in a funny way the one-minute man. And of course, you know, this is one of the causes. And number two is adultery. When the man or the woman have many sexual partners, they bring the bad luck into their relationship. So families, entire families collapse, not only couples, because of that. And this is why humanity is suffering today. Divorces and divorces and divorces. And many couples don't even want to get married because of, they are afraid of being married. And children, of course, are suffering and the entire human race is in troubles. So coming back into the tree, the two trees of paradise, the tree of the science of good and evil, and the tree of life. We should say that the tree of the science of good and evil is the same sexual energy. Please remember my words. It is the same sexual energy. And the tree of life is the Christ within each one of us. The cosmic Christ or resurrection, the perfect son, the perfect daughter of creation. Because many women have also experience, resurrection. Joan of Arc is one of them. Joan of Arc is a woman that when she reincarnated, she was already an angel, but she was mortal. She wasn't an archangel, but because of her incredible mission on earth, being such a young woman, you know, this young woman, she had to pass a final test which was to die for humanity. She had already a superior nature, but she had to die for humanity in an act of love, you know? And that act of love was bringing justice in Europe in the war between France and England. The British Empire at that time had invaded France and the French people were slaves of the British, of the Queen of England, of the Kingdom of England. And Joan of Arc, after she got liberation from England of the French, she was betrayed by both sides. 
the Church of England and the Catholic Church also, accusing her of being a witch, of being a demon with a human with a feminine body. And this woman, when she died, she knew exactly what she was doing. She started her mission when she was only 17, and she was burned alive a few years later. When she was being burned alive, she didn't hate anybody. She had diminished, destroyed totally her ego. She had learned to love even her, her worst enemies. She knew how to comprehend them, to understand them. And after she was burned alive, her body was completely destroyed. Superior beings took her dead body into the fourth dimension or paradise or heaven and angels who lived there rebuilt, recreated atom by atom, cell by cell of that destroyed body. And that complete rejuvenated body with the fire of the Holy Spirit and a resurrected matter, a perfected matter in a perfect combination of a spirit and matter which is the mystery of the cross when the spirit and matter become one she also resurrected and today she's walking with the same physical body in europe having tremendous missions without being recognized because she's extremely humble these superior beings don't even want to be noticed they are helping us without being noticed this is important for us to be understood all of us have the potential, have the genius within to ascend. So again, sex is a stairway to ascend into heaven or it's a stairway to descend into hell. It's up to us, up to you and me, up to everyone. God, the divinity, has given already the path. Moses, Jesus Christ, all founders of all religions, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, they all gave us the same path. Hermes Trismegistus from ancient Egypt. They all came to teach us the same, the same principles. Sex is a stairway to heaven or is a stairway to hell. When looking, when comparing religions, there are university professors that teach religions. Um, they don't think for a minute that they're all the same, but yet the Gnostics do, don't they? Yeah, yeah, that's correct, that's correct. Actually, we have gone deeper and deeper within the essence of all religions. And this is why, you know, there is a synthesis, a common synthesis. And this common synthesis had been taught by Moses within the Ten Commandments. And Jesus Christ reduced the Ten Commandments to three, when he said, if you want to come after me, Deny yourself. Number two, take your cross every day. Number three, follow me. It means, and the Gnostic do agree with that 100%. It means deny yourself, annihilate your animal psychology. That includes animal sex, fornication, and adultery. Number two, take your cross. The, the real meaning of that is not what people say. Oh, suffer, carry your cross, you know. Life is tough for everyone, which is also true. It is tough because we made it tough with our wrongdoings. But in reality, the mystery of the cross is learning to cross a spirit and matter. The vertical line is the spirit and the horizontal is matter. Make of it one. A spiritualizing matter through the superior kind of sex and, and annihilating the ego, the animal psychology, and after, when we spiritualize matter, allow the spirit to descend, to cross with matter. We can call it crystallizing the spirit. You see, and this is the mystery of resurrection. So this is the mystery of the cross. Take your cross every day. It means a man and a woman should practice this sexual encounter with the exception of those periods when the woman is eliminating, you know, recycling her own sexual energies yeah. to her own monthly period. But the rest of the month, there is nothing wrong for a couple to connect. Connect without orgasm, without ejaculation. And number three, follow me. It means after you have learned this knowledge, 
the superior kind of knowledge, which is not only religious, it's also pure science, pure science, to be able to ascend into higher levels of being, share that knowledge with the entire human race. This is what, what the prophets have done. This is what the disciple of Jesus Christ have done. This is what the disciple of Moses have done. All disciples of all times have done, sharing the knowledge. And it didn't matter if people didn't like you, people killed you, you continued doing it because it was a mission, you see? So the Ten Commandments, based on hundreds of cosmic laws, are reduced to only ten. But Jesus Christ reduced the ten to three, you see? And this is it. Basically, here is the essence. And the Gnostics do agree with it. Annihilation of the ego, uh, to be born again, what Jesus Christ said, to be born again means to recreate a superior nature, an angelical nature, or a perfect human being. And after, when you are able to resurrect, you are higher than a human being. You are a super being. You are an immortal being. You see? And after that, sacrifice for humanity. It means learning to love your worst enemies, learning to love the entire human race. So that's the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. Yeah. That's correct. So this is the end of uh, part two, special lecture part two. What should we look forward to in the third lecture in this series? Yeah, the third lecture will be a Gnostic approach, okay. which is a combination of both. But we are going to expand a little bit more into the Hindu religion when they speak about Kundalini Yoga, Tantra Yoga in Buddhism, you know, uh, and also what's written in, in a codified language within the Bible and the Old Testament and the New Testament. The secret teachings of Moses, for example, you know, etc., etc., and the secret teachings of Jesus Christ that includes the Gnostic Gospels found in Egypt 1945 and also the Gospels found in called the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are going to be talking about that in our lecture number three. Okay, thank you very much. You've been listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is special episode number two. My host today, Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for listening.